a number of years ago, well, it's quite a number of years ago already, more than 15, I was invited to teach for a semester at Harvard Divinity School, you know, that little school in Cambridge. Um, and um, I gave a seminar on the Gospel of John. 12-week Harvard semester. We just about made it through the prologue. I think we got to verse 14 or so. Um, and one of the graduate students there came up to me and she said, how come this is the Department of New Testament you're the only person teaching a canonical New Testament text. And I said, well, because teaching canonical New Testament text can be so boring. So she said, so how come you're doing it? I said, I'm not. I'm teaching a non-canonical Jewish text. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Uh, tonight's lecture is called The Talmudic Apocalypse, Chagiga chapter two, and you will need the handout. Uh, so if you don't have one, I think there are more in the back. Um, if, okay, it seems everyone has it. The reason I don't do PowerPoint things for something like this with the text is A, you can't take notes on a PowerPoint in, you know, if it's showing up in front of you, and B, you can't take it home to wrap fish in. So. As should be clear from the preceding lecture, I most certainly do not intend to posit the unbroken historical continuity of an esoteric tradition from the Second Temple to Three Enoch. History, including the history of myths and religious ideas, is always a product of a kind of bricolage produced within particular social conditions. And it is remarkable and necessitating historical explanation that at the very end of late antiquity, on the edges of the Middle Ages, we find such an explosion of new kinds of texts among Jews, namely the visionary apocalyptic mystical text that we call the Hechalot literature, and of which three Enoch, or also called Sefer Hechalot, is part and parcel. Andre Orloff, has done some key propodeutic work by bringing together all of the arguments for thematic and even verbal connections between the Second Temple Enoch material and texts found in the medieval Hechalot tradition. Orloff has added to the previous scholarship via detailed study of the two Enoch, that is the Slavonic version of Enoch, text, which demonstrably represents a medial position in the development of Enoch into the archangel of all the archangels, Metatron, as he is called in the rabbinic and Hechalot texts. One of the more impressive arguments to me at any rate has been the demonstration of the continuity of Enoch's role as high priest from Jubilees to Hechalot. Right, so from Jubilees um, what, second century BC, something like that, and all the way up to Echelot. Although I take it as given that these texts are a product of the same period in which the Talmud was redacted, i.e. the Hechalot text, which is, in my view, post-Amoraic, right? The Talmud is redacted post-Amoraic, and the Hechalot literature, I think, comes from roughly the same period, i.e. 7th century AD, something like that, and even later in some cases, and not the record of much earlier rabbinic thought, as Sholem had argued, I do suggest that one element in the bricolage is in danger of, of being lost in the shuffle. It is highly plausible that important tesserae had been circulating among Jews from the Second Temple times as parts of ancient, including especially Babylonian scribal wisdom, but not as an esoteric tradition. And that bits and pieces of them in one form or another show up within rabbinic literature, which is, after all, virtually the only Jewish literature we have between the Second Temple and the appearance of the Hechalot. 
Thus, to take a single example, it may well be that the Hechelot texts are quote-unquote phenomenologically different from earlier apocalyptic in that in the earlier texts the human is taken up into heaven without willing it, and in the latter there is an explicit ritual technique for achieving such rapture. It nonetheless remains the case that there can be historical continuities between the ideas of the two literatures. An important distinction needs to be made, which will, I hope, be helpful. The individuals who were taken on tours to heaven in the earlier apocalypses, especially Enoch, are not the same ones as are seeking heavenly journals, journeys in the Hechelot texts. Rather, the earlier ones, in the form of Enoch become Metatron, some, uh, are sometimes the very angels that guide the Latter-day Seeker's quest. Right? So if <clears throat> Enoch is transformed into the Son of Man in the earlier texts, particularly in 1 Enoch chapter 71, um, so he is the seer who is brought up to heaven and transformed. It is now in the rabbinic period, late um, ancient texts, it is now uh, rabbinic figures who want to go up to heaven exactly to see Enoch, the transformed, deified Enoch. And that, that implies a kind of historical continuity between the texts, not identicality, not something that is unchanged, something that's very much changed, but still in a kind of historical continuity. A, a distinction such as this separates between the phenomenological and the historical analysis, so that radical transformations of the tradition are comprehended along with its historical continuities. Thus, if an apocalypse then, Enoch is the human subject who is taken on tours and to whom matters are revealed owing to his deification, Owing to his de deification, in Apocalypse Now, he has become the chief angel second divinity who reveals such matters, mutatis mutandis, to Rabbi Ishmael, also a figure in the past for the writers of Hechalod. The structure remains quite constant and fits perfectly the definition given by Himmelfarb that I quoted last night. There may be no doubt, then, that Sefer Hechalod is an Apocalypse, and if we accept Himmelfarb's statement that, quote, all later apocalypses involving ascent to heaven are indebted to one Enoch either directly or indirectly, end quote, then the initial plausibility of a nexus between Hechelot and Enoch is transparent. If, as I have suggested, the apocalypses themselves, the ancient ones, or at least their traditions, were not secret and esoteric lore, their transmission from the Second Temple to Byzantine times seems much more plausible. This view is therefore subtly but crucially different from the position of scholars of Jewish mysticism who posit otherwise unattested esoteric channels of transmission for this material. Rather, what I intend here is to make a case precisely for the broken, fraught, and contested transmission and reception, and especially that the figure of a second god transformed into or from a human had not been, nor ever would be, entirely exiled from the religious life of Jewry. In other words, while on the one hand I would certainly and definitely not associate myself with a scholarly tradition which posits Merkava mysticism in the Second Temple literature, and then goes so far as to use the later literature to reconstruct it, I also reject the view that allows for the transmission of these themes only among Christians with their eventual appearance in the Hechelot literature as a product of external influence. Notions of Jesus or Paul as Merkava mystics have always seemed risible and grossly ahistorical to me. Nonetheless, I continue to maintain that there are traceable developments of ideas within the very open tradition not an esoteric one, but a contested one, certainly not an Enochic Judaism. That can, right? Uh, 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 I, I, I no longer believe in Judaisms at all. 
I actually don't believe in Judaism anymore, just Jewry and all the doings that Jews do. But, <clears throat> but I certainly uh, um, think we, we've got to move be, beyond the notion of Judaisms, which was salutary in getting us off the idea that rabbinic Judaism is the real thing and everything else is sort of, you know, either corrupt or heretical or, or, or syncretistic or anything like that. So, so it was a necessary move, uh, Neusner's move, from Judaism to Judaisms. But uh, I think it's time now to uh, move beyond that because that implies, again, sort of set, closed in um, circles and movements, and I just don't see the evidence for that at all. Uh, um, so I don't, I don't buy Enoch Judaism either. That continued to indicate to my mind historical connections as well, namely the ontological transformation of Enoch into divine being and his ultimate historical transformation into Metatron. In this sense, it is equally a mistake to refer to rabbinic influence on three Enoch as it would be to deny possible intimacy with Christian traditions. In this lecture, in tonight's lecture, I hope to demonstrate that major and very specific themes characteristic of apocalypses were alive in the worlds of the rabbis that, who formed the Talmud. So part one, the Talmudic apocalypse. Those who were here yesterday will see how this is actually a, 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 an expansion of things that I said in brief yesterday. <clears throat> I will focus on the import of a text in rabbinic literature that has been much investigated but not fully exploited in this inquiry in the past. I referred to the Talmudic sugya, especially in the Bavli, on the first Mishnah of the second chapter of Tractate Chagiga. This passage, and especially its earlier parallels and sources, have been dubbed in the past the mystical collection. For the purposes of the present inquiry, I will name it, especially in the version to be found in the Bavli, the Talmudic Apocalypse. Seeing as it contains at least two of the elements that characterize apocalyptic literature of the Second Temple, namely cosmological meteorological information and theosophy, together, cheek by jowl, as it were. It is important and interesting to note that prior delvings into these questions, namely the question of the survival of apocalyptic themes, literatures, ideas from Second Temple times into the early Byzantine era, have for the most part focused only on the so-called Merkava mystical texts, the theosophical elements, much less attention has been paid to an equally important element, namely the cosmological speculation rife in the apocalypses and prominent in the Talmud as well. My main witness for this insight is a piece of evidence that has been hiding in plain sight. Although, to the best of my knowledge, this witness has been ignored by and large by scholars asking this question, I have subsequently seen, very happily, that a great scholar of an earlier generation from the non-academic wing of Talmudic scholarship already adumbrated the point. By which I'm saying, uh, I mean, a traditionalist scholar, you know, a classic, uh, um, you know, old guy with long beard, hat, and probably a talus while he was writing his uh, notes. This very famous passage from the Mishnah is in Tractate Chagiga, chapter 2-1. You know, that's one difference, I, I think, between, between Talmudic, traditional Talmudic learning and modern scholarship. As a modern scholar, if I, if I discover something and then discover that somebody else discovered it 100 years ago or something, um, I'm not happy, right? But um, uh, there's enough of me, that, there's enough of some sort of yeshiva bacher left in me that when I discover something and I find that some big, you know, Talmud Chacham, Talmud scholar of 200 years ago said it, I feel very good. <laughs> so, 
Although the text of this mission is contested in some details, it is essentially translatable as, and this is the first text you have on the handout. One does not expound forbidden sex among three, or the work of creation between two, and the work of the chariot with even one, unless he is a sage who understands by himself. One who looks at four things, it would have been a mercy for him, or there's an alternative reading in some manuscripts that would have been fitting for him, had he not come into the world. Anyone who was not careful for the honor of his maker, it would have been a mercy for him, had he not come into the world. It has been clear since the beginning of the Wissenschaft des Judentums, if not even higher than that, that the Mishnah here is polemicizing against someone or others specific. The general scholarly opinion, until fairly recently, with only some antithetical voices crying in the wilderness, has been that these are anti-Gnostic declarations. Particularly, the, so, the supposed clue for that was they, they took um, anyone who was not careful for the honor of his maker to mean the Gnostics who consider the demiurge as a secondary and evil sort of divinity. I, uh, that's a clever reading, but uh, I'm not finally persuaded by it. And uh, I'm going to give you a sense of why I choose an alternative. Now, there is little doubt that the Palestinian Talmudic material and Genesis Rabbah are suffused with anti-Gnostic rhetoric. As the great Jerusalem Bible scholar Samuel Levinston summed up the matter in 1916, this Mishnah, in which one feels its recall, recoil from esoteric literature, is one of the most well-known among Jews, and well-known as well is its embedding in astonishing and startling discussions in the Talmuds, whose mythological character in general and Gnostic character in particular stands out to the investigator's eye, end quote. Menachem Kahana, in a much more recent publication, explained the very existence of the extended discussion of Genesis 1 in Bereshit Rabbah as a product of the desire to counter those readers of Genesis, formerly known as Gnostics, who distinguished between a good God and a bad demiurge. There is much to commend such an approach, even to prove it, vis-a-vis -vis Genesis Rabbah and the Yerushalmi, the Palestinian Talmud. Lowenstein suggests the point that I will defend, albeit with an important variation, to the effect that the way that the late antique uh, texts interpret the Mishnah needs to be separated from the most compelling historical interpretation of the Mishnah itself. Right? In other words, that we shouldn't uh, I mean, this is uh, philology 101, that we shouldn't interpret the earlier text necessarily through the um, later text, although the, the, the later text certainly should have a vote, at least, on the interpretation of the earlier text. Um, one of my teachers, I can't resist telling some stories sometimes, because who, who am I going to tell them to? Uh, one of my teachers, um, a professor... Moshe Zucker, uh, who, with whom I studied at JTS, went to teach at Bar Ilan for a year, and he was terrified that the students would consider him, you know, an apicorus, a heretic, uh, um, um, because he is a critical scholar. He said, after a few weeks, I had to say to the boys, this was all boys, 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 sometimes the Talmud did understand the Mishnah. <laughs> so. <laughs> As Lowenstein writes, and I concur, quote, it follows that the Mishnah is critical of mystical philosophical speculations. There is no basis, however, says Lowenstein, for connecting these meditations that the Mishnah rejects to the Gnostic doctrine. The formula underwent a process of updating in the light of Gnosis, end quote. Once we have separated the Mishnah from its later anti-Gnostic interpretations, as in the Palestinian Amoraic text, we are free to look for other possible contexts in which it originally functioned. 
While Lowenstam wishes to connect the Mishnah's formulation with that of the Bible and an Akkadian letter, I prefer rather to connect it directly with a source much closer to home, to wit, Sefer Ben Sira, Ecclesiasticus, which is cited in the Bavli itself as a justification for the Mishnah's ruling. In Ben Sira 3, 21-23, we read, do not expound or investigate, right, Kakor, <clears throat> that which is wondrous for you and that which is hidden from you do not research. Contemplate only that which is permitted to you and you have no business with hidden things. Do not meddle in that which is beyond you for you have been shown matters that are too great for you. The Talmud saw clearly the connection between this passage and the Mishnah. Now, even though I have argued above in the first lecture, in the wake of others, that it is a mistake to see Ben Sira as coming from circles entirely other to the ones that produced Enoch, suggesting rather that, there were, that this is part of general wisdom uh, scribal communities, it is certainly critical, that is, Ben Sira is certainly critical inter alia, precisely in this passage of apocalyptic knowledge, just as the Talmud realized thus suggesting quite strongly that the Mishnah's context is condemnation of apocalyptic knowledge as well. The single most important recent advance in this question is from the pen of Annette Yoshiko Reed. Reed's aim is to use the Mishnah as a means for discovering why all apocalypses other than Daniel were excluded from the canon and then allegedly lost to non-Christian Jews question that was addressed to me yesterday. Although I disagree with her conclusion, her premise is incontrovertible. Quote, for us it suffices to note that while the Mishnah seeks only to limit the public exposition of Masse Breshit and Amer Kava, it mounts an outright condemnation of speculation into what is above, what is below, what is before, what is after. This four-part phrase aptly describes the complex of concerns that we find explored in Apocalypses. An interest in the cosmos, from the heights of heaven to the very ends of the earth, above and below, and an interest in the meaning of history stretched along the entire axis of historical time, before and after. As with Ben Sirah centuries earlier, this ruling, that is the Mishnah's ruling, seems to respond to individuals or groups engaged in such speculations, and it is plausible that those Jews who composed and transmitted apocalypses should be counted among its targets." End quote. Not against Gnostics, then, the Mishnah is an anti-apocalyptic Jeremiad, similar in thought and even language to that of Ben Sirah and probably dependent on Ben Sirah. Reed's general comparison of motifs can be strengthened significantly via a quotation from the parables or similitudes of Enoch, the second section of one Enoch. And the other angel who went with me and showed me what is hidden told me what is first and last in the heaven in the height and beneath the earth in the abyss and at the ends of heaven and on the foundation of heaven. Right? So there you've got an almost precise enumeration of what the angel shows the apocalyptic seer, and it matches very closely with exactly that which the Mishnah says you are not supposed to inquire into. Would it be going too far to suggest that this text enables us to decode the Mishnah's four directions and also provides us with the context of the Mishnah's polemic itself? It is exactly the revelation of things hidden by heavenly beings to which the Mishnah objects. And the list in the Apocalypse of what the seer has been shown corresponds exactly to the list of things forbidden to see in the Mishnah. One does not have to imagine that the Enoch text was known to the Tanaim, but only that practices of apocalyptic speculation were known to them as something they at least sometimes resisted. If the Tanaitic literature cannot be used, and it cannot, Orbach has shown, to reconstruct Merkabah's speculation among the early rabbis, 
it can be used, I suggest, to demonstrate that apocalyptic ideas were alive and well in the environment of the Tanaim, alive and kicking enough to require serious attempts at suppression. Right? So that brings us up to the third century or so. Right? Not absolutely uh, airtight, watertight proof, but at least uh, some good evidence that um, Palestinian Jews were aware of apocalyptic speculation and apocalyptic uh, texts as late as the uh, redacting of the Mishnah. I would offer that the Mishnah's primary objection to such kinds of knowledge was the implicit claim of authority that they made independent of and perhaps in competition with the rabbi's oral Torah, the exclusive possession of the rabbinic community and authority structure. If this argument bears weight, it shows strongly that apocalyptic speculation and perhaps even apocalyptic texts were known to Palestinian Jews in the first three centuries of the Christian era. In what follows, I wish to explore in some detail the enormous implications that a counter-apocalyptic reading of the Mishnah bears for our larger questions of the history and emergence of early medieval Jewish visionary traditions and their doctrines and their Christian congeners. In particular, I will look closely at the Babylonian Talmudic sugya on this Mishnah, which is, it turns out, an absolutely key text that has been much disregarded until now on all sides of the day, debate about Apocalypse and Hechalot. The first observation that I wish to make here in general is that the sugya of the Talmud seems strongly to identify the study of Maasei Breshit, the work of creation, with cosmological information of various types. Right? So Maasei Breshit, which we might have understood as being uh, only about the um, what's it called, the, um, the six days, right? Yeah. Um, um, we see from the Talmud was understood as being about cosmology and even what we might call, um, you know, astronomical science <laughs> or meteorology or something. This becomes clear from the very organization of the Talmudic passage. You have all these texts in front of you, so. Not in Maasei Breshit, in two. From whence these words, asked the Talmud, as it is taught by our rabbis, i.e. in a Tanaitic source, when you ask about the first days, right? Citation from Deuteronomy. One may ask, but two may not ask. When you ask about the first days, it's in the singular, so the... the the uh, Braita, the Midrash, derives from this. Only one person can ask, not two. We might suppose that a person may ask about before the creation of the world. It comes to teach us from the day on which God created Adam on the earth, the continuation of the Deuteronomy verse. We might suppose that a person may not ask about the six days of creation. It comes to teach us about the first days that were before you. We might suppose that one may ask about what is above, what is below, what is before, and what is after. It comes to teach from one end of the heaven to the other end of heaven. You ask about from one end of heaven to the other end of heaven. You do not ask about what is above, what is below, what is before, what is after. We learn several things from this passage in the Bavli. First, that according to the Bavli, at any rate, there is continuity between the clause of the Mishnah that forbids the study of Maase Breshit in a group larger than two, and the clause that delimits what may be investigated. Indeed, according to the Bavli, both of these points derive from the same Baraita. Secondly, it is quite clear from this use of the Baraita in the Bavli that there is no distinction between Drosh and Sha'ol, right, to determine or teach and to ask. You know, to expound or teach and to ask. And it seems histakel as well in this context to, 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 to peer, to look. Uh, again, whatever distinctions we may find in other rabbinic literary traditions. Up to this point, at any rate, the Talmud seems to be 
interpreting and supporting the Mishnah's restrictions. In the very next line, however, the Bavli goes off on quite a different direction. Now that he derives it from one end of the heavens to the other, why do we need from the day on which Adam was created on earth? Right? If we already know that you can't ask about what was before and what was after from the verse from one end of the heavens to the other, what do we need from the day on which Adam was created on the earth? What do we learn from that? He needs it for the view of Rabbi Elazar, as Rabbi Elazar said. The primeval Adam was from the earth to the heaven, as it says, from the day on which Adam was created on earth and to the end of heaven. Right? So if Adam was created on earth and to the end of heaven, it means he was that tall. Right? From earth and to the end of heaven. Once he sinned, the Holy Blessed One placed his hands upon him and made him small. As it says, after and before you formed me, and you placed your hand upon me, from Psalms. Rav Yehuda said that Rav had said, primeval Adam was from one end of the world to the other. Not from the earth to the heaven, but from one end of the world to the other. For it says, which Adam was created on earth unto the end of heaven and unto the end of heaven, right? So if you read the whole verse, you end up with from one end of heaven to the other end of heaven. And once he sinned, the Holy Blessed One placed his hands upon him and made him small. As it says, after and before, you formed me and you placed your hand upon me. If that's the case, the verses contradict each other, Right? If one verse, or actually one part of the verse, suggests that he extended from earth to heaven, and the other verse says that if he was lying down, he went from one end of heaven to the other, the two verses contradict each other. That's not a problem. That's this one and that one are the same measure. In other words, we now know that um, the world is a hemisphere, right? And standing in the middle of it, is the same distance as lying down from end to end, right? Did I get the geometry right there? Yeah, okay. A fair amount of glossing will be necessary here. First of all, the Bavli clearly understands by what is before and what is after a temporal distinction, not a spatial one. That's why they say, if we learn it from, um, if we learn it from um, if we learn it from one end of the heavens to the other, why do we need from the day on which, right? So they're understanding this temporal. This has been recognized many times, beginning from the 11th century to commentators, the Tosafot, in northern France and the Rhineland. It is only thus that it can claim that the author of the Breite has learnt the restriction on investigation of that which is before creation from the verse that says what is before and what is after, which is perfectly ambiguous in Hebrew between a spatial and a temporal reading. Before and after being completely readable also as in front of and behind. This renders the two parts of the verse, from the day, etc., and from one end to the other end, as apparently redundant, as it suggests that we can learn from either of them the injunction against study of that which is before creation. Then the solution that the Bavli offers to this apparent redundancy involves two highly esoteric interpretations of the verse itself. One that reads, created the primeval man on the earth and to the end of heaven, cutting the verse at that point, right in the middle, in good Midrashic fashion, while the other reads, created the primeval man from one end of the heaven to the other end of the heaven, reading the whole verse together. Um, in case you're not familiar with that kind of reading practice, um, it's pretty common and pretty serious in Midrash. One of the proofs of the resurrection of the dead is a verse that says, Hincha shochevim avotecha vekam ha'am Right? God speaking to Moses says, Behold, you will lie with your fathers, i.e. be dead, 
and this nation will rise up in rebellion. The rabbis have no problem with reading that verse as Hincha Shochevim Avotecha Vakam. Behold, you will lie with your ancestors and arise and simply chop off the rest of the verse, right? Thus proving that there will be a resurrection. Right? This is not jokes. This is, this is, this is serious stuff. It's, it's, it's a kind of understanding of the way language works, that you, know, you, can, take, you can take any meaningful section out of context and, and, uh, and interpret it. Uh, this is uh, the kind of work that Stephen Frada and I, um, trying to figure this out, have devoted much of our lives to, with uh, slightly divergent results, but mostly consistent. At this point, and undoubtedly, whenever we disagree, uh, I'm sure Stephen is right. Um, at this point, there seems now to be a contradiction between these two possible readings of the verse that leads to a contradiction in fact, in race. How tall was the primeval Adam? From the earth to the heaven or from one end of the heaven to the other? And the Talmud answers that these two measures are the same, the heavens being a kind of half sphere over the flat earth. For our purposes, at any rate, the most significant matter to observe here is that effectively the Bavli has performed a switch here from explaining the Mishnah's ruling to itself practicing interpretation or inquiring into Maasei Breshi. In other words, the restriction against dealing with such matters to some kind of private or near private instruction has been completely breached and we are in the very midst of the matter from here on down. This, this is Maase Breshi, the investigation of the work of creation. That is cosmology, far beyond what we could learn from the verses of Genesis themselves, and it goes on from here. I, I hope the point is clear that in interpreting a prohibition, the Bavli slips right into violating that prohibition. In my view, however, the most revealing moment comes a page or so later when the third century Palestinian Amora Rabbi Shimon Bar Lakish, otherwise known as Reish Lakish, shares with us the following cosmological exposition. Rav Yehuda said there are two heavens, for it says indeed to Hashem your God are the heavens and the heavens of the heavens. Reish Lakish said there are seven, and these are they. Curtain, firmament, grinders, lofty, dwelling, foundation, and clouds. Those are the names of the seven heavens. Curtain does nothing but enters in the morning and comes out in the evening. And thus renews every day the work of creation. As it says, he spreads out the heaven like gossamer and stretches it like a tent for dwelling. Firmament is where the sun and the moon and the stars and the signs of the zodiac are fixed. As it says, and God placed them in the firmament of heaven. Grinders in which millstones stand and grind manna for the righteous. As it says, and he commanded grinders above and the doors of heaven opened and rained down manna on them to eat. Lofty, in which Jerusalem and the temple and the altar are built. And Michael, the great prince, stands and sacrifices on it a sacrifice. As it says... I have indeed built a lofty house for you, <coughs> a foundation for your eternal dwelling. And how do we know that it is called heaven? For it is written, look down from the heaven and see from the loftiness of your holiness and splendor. Dwelling, in which there are bands of serving angels who say song at night and are quiet during the day in honor of Israel. As it says, during the day God will command his grace, and at night there is song with him. And how do we know that it is called heaven? For it says, look from your holy dwelling from the heaven. Foundation, in which there are the treasuries of snow and of hail, and the store place for bad dew, and the store place for gentle dew, and the chamber for storm and hurricane, and the cave of steam with its doors of fire. For it says, God will open for you his good treasury. 
clouds in which justice, law, and equity, the storehouses of life and the storehouses of peace and the storehouses of blessing and the souls of the saints and the spirits and souls who will be created in the future and the dew that the Holy Blessed One will use to resurrect the dead. This is where the wheels and the fire angels and the holy living beings, Chayot Kodesh, and the serving angels and the glorious throne and the king, the living God, the exalted, dwells on them in clouds. For it says, make way for the rider on the clouds. His name is Ka. And how do we know that it is called heaven? We learn it from a Shava, riding, riding. Here it is written, make way for the rider on the clouds. His name is Ka. And there is written, the rider on the heavens is there to aid you. And darkness and cloud and fog surround him, as it says, he will make darkness his hiding place around him. His tabernacle is the darkness of water, the thick clouds of the heaven. Scholars have been looking for apocalypses in the Hechelot literature and ignoring the clear apocalyptic affinities of our text in the Bavli. First of all, the information about seven heavens that we find in the Bavli here is closely related, related to the ascent through seven palaces that we find in Enoch. Secondly, we find close and precise affinities in details between the Reish Lakish text and parallels in 1 and 2 Enoch. Re real detail, you'll see. One striking example will suffice for the nuns. In the parables of Enoch, we find the following passage. And after this, I saw all the secrets of heaven and how the kingdom is divided and how the deeds of men are weighed in the balance. There I saw the dwelling of the chosen and the resting places of the holy, and my eyes saw there all the sinners who deny the name of the Lord of Spirits being driven from there. And they dragged them off, and they were not able to remain because of the punishment that went out from the Lord of Spirits. And there my eyes saw the secret of the flashes of lightning and of the thunder, and the secrets of the winds, how they are distributed in order to blow over the earth, and the secrets of the clouds and of the dew, and there I saw from where they go out in that place. And how from there the dust of the earth is saturated. And there I saw closed storehouses from which the winds are distributed. And the storehouse of the hail and the storehouse of the mist and the storehouse of the clouds. And its cloud remained over the earth from the beginning of the world. Etc. Um, yeah, that's, that's enough. Uh, you can read the rest on your own. Closer parallels to the enumeration of the heavens can also be found in the Enoch literature. For instance, a very similar enumeration of the seven heavens in two Enoch, as well as the ascension of Isaiah. But from this text, we see already some impressive and important details, notably the intense attention to the details of meteorological phenomena as secrets of the heavens. Especially convincing is the image of the weather kept in storehouses or treasuries, one of the most striking features of the Talmudic text we have just seen. The upshot of this is that at least according to the Bavli, it seems most plausible to understand Maasei Bereshit as the cosmological side of apocalyptic knowledge and Maasei Merkava as the theosophical side of apocalypse. The combination of cosmology and meteorology and then the combination of that with those with theosophy that we will observe in the next of these lectures, both in the Apocalypses and in the Talmud, suggests strongly a continuity of tradition from the Second Temple Apocalyptic to the Sugiya of the Babylonian Talmud, a continuity that is sufficient to explain how ideas and mythic materials from the former texts survived exoterically within non-Christian Jewish circles until their full-blown re-emergence in Hebrew-Aramaic literature towards the end of late antiquity. This re-emergence might very well have been stimulated by developments within the spirituality of the encompassing Christian world, and even part and parcel of these developments, right? So I'm not arguing for hermetic, again, I mean, I can't say this often enough, I'm not going in the other direction and arguing for some pristine, you know, Jewish, uh, inner Jewish uh, uh, development, which would simply go against everything that I stand for intellectually for, for the last 30 years. Right? As Hermann has remarked, Klaus Hermann this is, indeed a distinctive feature of three Enoch is its engagement 
with the cosmological and angelological conceptions of the older Merkava tradition, albeit in an apocalyptic mode. The literary material used to construct its cosmology and angelology is far closer to rabbinic literature than to any putative Gnostic speculative tradition regarding the eons, end quote. But the very concatenation of cosmological and angelological materials matters in the Talmud draws the Talmudic text to the ancient apocalypses as well, and thus provides the missing link between them, hidden, as it were, in plain sight. To be sure, the Talmud is almost too careful not to ascribe this information to angelic revelation. But as Martha Himmelfarb has done well to remind us, these references to ascent remind us that the descriptions of the heavenly liturgy and the divine throne and the lists of angelic names presuppose ascent even when it is not described. Right? In other words, if Reish Lekish has a list of the seven heavens and what's in each one of them, some ascent at some point is presupposed. Somebody went up there and saw it. Instructions for invoking angels to descend to reveal the secrets of the Torah play an important part in the Hechalot texts. But all explicit attributions of descriptions of the contents of the heavens, and especially the heavenly liturgy, are to human beings who ascend. It seems hardly too presumptuous, then, to suggest at least that at one stage in its transmission, Reish Lakish's description of the seven heavens and their contents was accompanied by an account of how that knowledge had been gained. The most impressive parallel that I have found, however, is from the text known as To Enoch, preserved only in Old Church Slavonic, with perhaps some Coptic fragments extant. There's a lot of controversy about the Coptic fragments. This text is apparently from the first century AD and from Palestine. In it, we read of Enoch's journey through the seven heavens. And I'm just going to read, read little bits of this, uh, what I've given you. You can read the rest on your own. Um, the ascension of heaven to the first heaven. And it came about when I had spoken to my sons, the men called me, and they took me onto their wings and carried me up to the first heaven. And they put me down there. They led before my face the elders, the rulers of the stellar orders, and they showed me their movements and their aberrations from year to year. And they showed me in the light the angels who govern the stars, the heavenly combinations. And they showed me there a vast ocean, much bigger than the earthly ocean, and the angels were flying with their wings. And they showed me there the treasuries of the snow and the cold. Terrible angels are guarding the treasuries. <coughs> and they showed me there those guarding the treasuries. And they showed me there the treasuries of the clouds from which they go in and come out. And they showed me the treasuries of the dew, like olive oil. Angels were guarding their treasuries, and their appearance was like very earthly flower. I'm skipping all the part that I bolded. And the men lifted me up from there, and they carried me up to the fourth heaven. And they showed me there all the movements and displacements and all the rays of light of the sun and the moon. I measured their movements, I compared their light, and I saw that the sun has a light seven times greater than the, than the sun. It should be the moon, of course. There's a mistake in the text. In the, uh, um, I mean, not in my text, in the manuscript. Their circle and their chariots on which each of them rides, passing like the wind. And there is no rest for them by day and night as they go off and come back. And four great stars holding on to the right-hand side of the sun's chariot, on the left-hand side, going with the sun perpetually and going in front of the sun's chariot. Skip the sixth. And in the midst of them are seven phoenixes and seven cherubim, six winged beings having but one voice and singing in themselves. Their song is not to be reported. The Lord is delighted by his footstools, right? So we get the element of the angelic singing in there too. And the men lifted me up from there and they carried me to the seventh heaven. And I saw a great light and all the fiery armies of the club, incorporeal ones, archangels, angels, and the shining Otanim stations. And I was terrified and I trembled and the men picked me up with their uh, vakat, and they said to me, be brave, Enoch, don't be frightened. 
And they showed me from a distance the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the heavenly armies assembled according to rank, advancing and doing obeisance to the Lord. And then they withdrew and went to their places in joy and merriment, in immeasurable light, but gloriously serving him. By night, nor departing by day, standing in front of the face of the Lord, carrying out his will with all the army of cherubim around his throne, never departing, and the six-winged ones covering his throne, singing in front of the face of the Lord. Even this partial citation of the passage is surely enough to teach us two things. First of all, it is clear that Reish Lakish's account of the seven heavens stems from the same kind of literary tradition as this passage. Aside from the seven heavens themselves, there are two very impressive specific congeners. First, once again, as we saw in the parables of Enoch, the specific interest in meteorological information as a major part of what the angels reveal, with even the detail of treasuries for the hail and the snow and the dew. And second, the content of the seventh heaven with the Merkava in it, which is exactly what Reish Lakish has as well. There are, moreover, other echoes present as well, such as the constant singing of the angels. The other important thing that we learn from this comparison is that Reish Lakish's tradition does not stem directly from Tu Enoch at all. The order and placement of various elements in the heavens is quite different. And more importantly, there is much more emphasis in Tu Enoch on the presence of evil things in the heavens. Only the bad dew remains in the Talmudic version. Uh, you may be noticing a certain vacillation in the way I pronounce D-E-W. Sometimes I say do, and sometimes I say do. Uh, growing up in New Jersey, we always said do, Tuesday. But when I, you know, um, became the American version of an Oxbridge scholar, namely teacher at Berkeley, I decided I'd better talk posh. So I started saying do. But now it seems obvious that the one, um, well, very likely result of this year's election is that the next president of the United States is, is going to come from New York City. And I'm not making any political comment here. Uh, I think we'll all be saying do again and, and huge. So I'm going to revert to my um, old New Jersey speech. In my presentation until now, I have sought to document some strong connections, both general, that is the presence of cosmology and theosophy together, and detailed, to establish the living connection of rabbinic tradition, both in the Mishnah, negatively as it were, and in the Bavli, positively, with some second temple apocalyptic traditions. The claim, once again, is not that the rabbis had one and two Enoch before them, nor that there were secret lines of transmission of these texts, but that ideas and even basic literary structures from them remained alive in the cultural world of the Jews of rabbinic times and are reflected as well in the official texts of the rabbis. Right? This is, uh, should give you some more of a sense of why I don't want to talk about Judaisms. Because I, I, I think that uh, traditions that were passed down among Jews who were not part and parcel of the rabbinic uh, uh, community were open, that the rabbis were open to them, aware of them, uh, and this can be uh, demonstrated on many different uh, levels. In the next lecture, and thus final part of this presentation, I shall seek to show that many of these traditions appear again in the Merkava literature, and especially in Three Enoch. Transformed, to be sure, melded with other traditions, no doubt, but still that including Byzantine, Christian, and Iranian traditions, as I've learned recently from Professor Kiel's work, but still recognizably a not-so-secret sharer in the greater Jewish tradition that comprised the rabbis as well. Metatron, I will argue, owes as much to Enoch, if not more, as to Jesus. Thank you.